Hi, I'm Steve Pennick, President of the International Statistical Institute, and I'm delighted that the ISI is joining with the ISC in presenting this webinar today. We're pleased to be members of the ISC. This is the last of a six part series on COVID and the social sciences, public understanding, and the use of statistics in relation to the pandemic. These webinars have explored the impact of the social sciences on the pandemic and the impact of the pandemic on the social sciences. The webinars have so far covered economics, psychology, sociology, political science, and anthropology. This final webinar covers statistics. The webinar will address the following two questions. How effective were statistics in informing citizens and policymakers in thinking about the pandemic and in formulating responses to the pandemic? And secondly, how has the pandemic impacted on developments within statistics and on the communication of statistics to citizens and policymakers? I'm not going to try and answer these questions in this brief introduction. Let me just say that certainly in the UK, where I come from, the pandemic has raised the profile of statistics. Statisticians have shown what they can do. Part of the challenge for us now is to learn the lessons from all this so that the reputation for responsiveness and relevance are built in for challenges of the future. And I hope this webinar will contribute towards this goal. And I have to say, I'm speaking to you from uh, Krakow in Poland, where we're just wrapping up the conference of the International Association for Official Statistics. And this topic of the impact of statistics and COVID has been very much discussed here. So today we have a distinguished panel of speakers, but my job is just to introduce our chairman and I will leave the rest to him. Craig Calhoun is University Professor of Social Sciences at Arizona State University and Centennial Professor at the London School of Economics. Previously, he was Director of the LSE, President of the UK Social Science Research Council and a Professor at UNC Chapel Hill, Columbia, and NYU, where he founded the Institute for Public Knowledge. Professor Calhoun is well known for having published on social movements, democracy, technology, political economy, culture and social change and is known for his interest in the public contribution of social science. So now I hand over to you, Craig. Thank you. Thanks very much, Steve. Um, let me join in welcoming all of our participants to this webinar on behalf of both the International Statistical Institute and the International Social Science Council. Um, as Steve said, this webinar is part of a series exploring how different social science disciplines have both helped us understand the COVID-19 pandemic and themselves been shaped by it. All the previous webinars are posted to the ISC website, and this one will be posted in the future should people want to consult it or use pieces in teaching or other ways. And as Steve said, today we look at statistics, which has been absolutely central during the last two and a half years of the COVID pandemic. Statistics is both a discipline in itself and a key interdisciplinary dimension of other fields throughout science, including, but of course not limited, to social science. And indeed, issues of public health have been among the drivers of advancements in statistics throughout its history. During COVID, it has been key to medical understanding, for example, in fields like epidemiology that have moved to the forefront, and to policymaking. It has also been basic to public understanding, though this has involved trying to inform a public often ill at ease with statistics and prone to misunderstandings. Such basic points as the difference between absolute numbers of cases and rates of occurrence or prevalence have proved challenging for too many citizens. And indeed, they have occasionally tripped up commentators in the media and politicians and others. Statistician, statisticians have responded with ever clearer explanations. Indeed, the pandemic has probably advanced public understanding of statistics, leading more people to gain the ability to reason with statistics. There have been impressive improvements in the visual representations of quantitative data, but still many citizens find it challenging to read a graph. And there are issues not only in general education, but also in how clearly policymakers grasp statistics. This has led to demands for 
statisticians to inform public discussion, medical science, and policymaking. All this comes at a time when statistics are more important than ever, and statistics as a field is itself changing, not least with the rise of new kinds of data science. To guide us, we have a very distinguished speaker. Professor David Spiegelhalter is chair of the Winton Center for Risk and Evidence Communication at the University of Cambridge, which aims to improve the way that statistical evidence is used by health professionals, patients, lawyers and judges, media and policymakers. He is the author of two major recent books, The Art of Statistics, which I recommend to anyone seeking a general introduction, published in March 2019, and COVID by the Numbers, more specifically on what we have learned during the pandemic and how to understand the pandemic, published in October of last year. During the COVID crisis, David has been a key advisor to government and medical authorities and a leader in advancing public understanding. He was knighted in 2014 for services to medical statistics, was president of the Royal Statistical Society, and became a non-executive director of the UK Statistics Authority in 2020. We are fortunate to have him with us. And after he speaks, we have three excellent discussions who discussants whom I will introduce individually before their comments. I also want to remind audience members that they may post questions or comments at any time using the Zoom Q&A function. And I will try to revert to these with help from the ISC staff um, and channel them to David and the discussants at the end of the formal presentations when we have more open time for discussion. With no further ado, let me introduce you to David Spiegelhalter. Okay, thank you very much indeed for that very kind and generous introduction. Well, this is um, a great honor to be doing this. And uh, frankly, I'm really looking forward to it. Well, I'm frankly looking forward to my bit being over and so I can listen to the discussants. Um, I should point out, I'm gonna give a very personal view of my work or my, you know, my impressions over the last two years of dealing with the statistics of the pandemic. As David mentioned, they've been absolutely vital to our understanding and the general argument and um, discourse about, about, about the virus. And so, um, yeah, off, off I go. I'm, I'm not going to try to go on too long, um, but I hope to raise a number of points. I, okay, so I'm going to try sharing my screen and see if this works. Okay, there we are. Um, it, as was mentioned, I'm a non-executive director for the UK Statistics Authority, and that means that I am on the board of the official statistics body for the UK. And so, I'm, of course, I'm going. I'm biased. I will say what wonderful work they've been doing. So please take that into account. Um, as was mentioned, I got this book, The Art of Statistics, which has um, been selling quite well. Nothing like a pandemic to sell statistics books. And um, I, I start that book with this quote from Nate Silver, author of The Signal of the Noise. Um, and this is one I, I kind of repeat all the time because I think it's so important to keep it in mind. The numbers have no way of speaking for themselves. We speak for them, we imbue them with meaning. And that's essentially why I call the book The Art of Statistics. That, you know, interpreting data is not some automatic algorithmic process. It's always a matter of judgment, of context, of background knowledge, of understanding where the data comes from, simply understanding what the numbers even might mean. And that has been shown up again and again during the COVID pandemic. And I'd like to illustrate with those points. So I'm not going to be talking about clever fancy statistics i used to do that kind of thing but um now um the crucial idea is almost just what are, what do the numbers even mean okay so um i um was i've been doing a lot of communication so for example with my colleague anthony masters all the last year every week we wrote a column in one of the main sunday newspapers the observer in the uk on on COVID statistics, a different matter every week, you know, basically what was in the news. Um, interesting, I do recommend it to anyone. You're allowed 350 words, no graphics, no, no obviously no formulae, no jargon, and trying to explain com complex subjects in that constraint 
is is a real challenge it was quite exhausting so we we only did it for a year and that was quite enough okay so um yeah so th then that actually resulted in this book covid by numbers which came out last year as was mentioned it's already you know a bit out of date so we're now thinking about the, the next edition the paperback edition now you know we're used to looking at this kind of thing this i just took this from our world in data which is the source i use you know they um, mainly looking at using Johns Hopkins data, but they're producing it a very nice visualization, very easy to use to make comparisons between countries. Um, and that's really just to illustrate the fact that there's so much data is available. Um, we can look at it, um, obviously, by this is just co confirmed COVID cases. There's all sorts of things we could do with this graph, which I won't try to illustrate now. We can do it as absolute number of cases or cases per million, which makes a better comparison. Uh, we can. This is smoothed over seven days to get a slightly smoother um, uh, experience rather than it jumping up and down all the time. But and we can vaguely see there's been a rise and a fall in these countries. But we really need to be careful about interpreting any of this data and making simplistic comparisons. And I just talk about the UK data. Um, you know, what is a confirmed COVID case? Well, in the UK, it's somebody who has been tested positive. Well, since tests stopped being free, you know, last month, our numbers have gone down hugely because everyone's getting COVID and no one's getting tested. And so our, the big decline in the UK that in this graph, it, it doesn't represent in any way what's actually going on in the country. Actually, you know, the numbers are declining, but nothing like at the rate that's being shown here. And it's purely, this just is, illustrates that it, that is purely because of the testing availability, in this case, that it's you know, stopped being free. Um, and that influences the numbers. So again, you know, we have to know how the data was collected, why it was collected, and what it means in order to make comparisons. And when we come to COVID deaths, where every country considers a COVID death in a different way, um, then we have to be even more careful. In the UK, we've got four different ways of defining a COVID death. So we have to be incredibly cautious. So making the first lesson, I think, is making comparisons between countries has to be done very cautiously. OK, um, the uh, just some points, vague points. Um, it's been a very busy time for public engagement. I generally feel that the national statistics offices in the UK and elsewhere have done a very good job in getting the stats out. Some have been better organised than others, um, but um, they've really done a good job producing dashboards and so on. Um, as, a, as a sort of expert, there's been a huge demand from the media for comments. Um, in the UK, we've been very lucky having this body, the Science Media Centre, that acts as a as a way of putting the scientists together with the with the journalists and providing quotes and so on. And that's enabled um, the scientific voice to be very prominent. And most journalists have acted very well. It's been excellent work by fact checkers. One thing I would say, though, and I'm sure I, I'd love to hear the experience of other people on the panel, is that as a expert um i find certainly early on in particular i was constantly being asked for who's to blame you know what's being done wrong what's going to happen and those blame and speculation the media love blame argument and speculation that's what they love and just i've had to learn very strongly so i'm not going to do that no no not my job not going to do it i'm not going to answer time and time again so i'm not going to answer those questions i'm just no 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 i'll, I'll talk about what i know about and if you do it in a light-hearted way it goes down very well and it's been accepted and the sort of interviews i now i get are, are completely different they really because there's been an appetite from the audience to have things explained well um I mean, this is the sort of thing I end up explaining all the time. This is the most recent data from the UK showing the number of deaths registered each week. The blue are the ones with COVID on the death certificate. The green are the ones without. The black line is the five-year average. So we can think about excess deaths, which is a very good way to compare um, different countries. In fact, if you are going to do it, um, I, and there's a huge, I'm not going to start trying to tell the stories, but there, there's, I could give a whole lecture just on this graph. Um, the, the the huge first spike um, there's if you look on the first spike there's excess non-covid deaths these were covid deaths but they weren't registered as much they were covid deaths in care homes of old people but um they but the, the, 
the death registration process wasn't putting it on the certificates. And a big deficit in non-COVID deaths here. Well, what was going on? There's no flu. Also, some of those people died earlier that would have died in that winter. So, you know, all sorts of things going on. There's warnings on the graph about how to um, interpret it and so on. So I think these are good. We also get dashboards such as this showing what's going on at the moment. Um, but we have to be careful all the time about knowing how the data was collected. So, for example, in the in England and in the UK, this is the curve for deaths within 28 days of a positive test by date of death. And it's a fairly smooth curve, you know, the black line being a, a five year, a, a seven day smooth. But if we look at it by the date reported, in other words, the number that's announced on the news every day, we get a completely different pattern. What are we getting? We're getting... Um, you know, great lumps of it. And now there's days when things are not being reported and suddenly there's a huge spike. Now, and and uh, they're not reported over the weekend. So there's always a huge big spike on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Um, now you'd have thought that journalists might kind of learn about that after two years, that there's always a spike. But no, what we still see is the Evening Standard, for example, the main London newspaper. Um, you know, these are some of their headlines over the last year or so. COVID deaths soar to 146. UK deaths soar to 262. Coronavirus deaths soar to 170. Boring, repetitive headlines. And the only common factor is that they're all on Tuesday. Every one of those is on Tuesday because Tuesday is always high. You know, can you believe that such bad reporting has happened and keeps on happening again and again? And that's because we can't just lump journalists together. We have to specialise, you know, separate the health and science journalists who know this stuff very well by now and the general journalists who still are completely hopeless at reporting statistics. OK. Um, we, we, one of the questions was about, you know, the, the collection of data and, and something I, I, I've got a real conflict of interest on is, is the enormous value of the COVID infection survey in the UK that was set up in April 2020. And I think it's pretty well unique in the world that we have been doing a representative longitudinal survey since almost the start of the pandemic. Um, it's unbelievably expensive it's been you know, 400 million pounds a year it's cost. It's been cut back now, but it's still going to be nearly 300 million pounds a year as it moves online. Incredibly expensive, incredibly valuable. Um, I'm chair of the advisory board, so I have a huge conflict of interest here. But for example, what is allowed are, you know, because they do regular antibody tests, um, the graph on the right shows that we know that 99% of the population of, of England and uh, of the UK have got antibodies to COVID, either through prior infection or through vaccination. And the antibody tests at, at a reasonably high level as well. So there's 99% have got antibodies to the virus. So, you know, there's a reason why, you know, in at the moment we've got we can have very high levels actually of infection with Omicron, but rather low levels of deaths are below average, for, for example, for the time of year. Now, this was a, an extraordinary example of a collaboration between the Office of National Statistics and academic statisticians in Oxford. It's been um, a, 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 a really brilliant piece of work. OK, other government communication has not been so great. I'd love to I just want to give some really bad examples of what happens when a government comms office gets hold of, of data. You know, this look at this for a formula, for heaven's sake. You know, it's just embarrassing when that was put up. It just got people were just so rude about this um, nonsensical attempt to a formula up and then graphs like that come in it's still available on our uk website what is it you know it's a horrible spaghetti of lines it's not clear whether it's on a log scale or not it's clearly just been bashed up in excel by some special advisors it's just awful um but i'd also like to point out to when government communication can go seriously wrong unless People really think carefully about how people are going to interpret it. So this is um, good data from the, the UK Health Security Agency back in June, which showed that the majority of deaths from COVID had been in the vaccinated group. In other words, deaths from COVID in the non-vaccinated group were much lower than deaths from COVID in the vaccinated group in terms of the numbers. 
Okay, that sounds, you know, quite strong. And we tried to explain that back in June. Um, why most people who die with COVID in England have had a vaccination. And um, the usual argument is it's because nearly everybody at high risk has been vaccinated. The vaccine isn't perfect. And so there's going to be some breakthrough cases. And those actually outnumber the cases in the vaccinated group, the, the deaths in the vaccinated group. And the analogy, could we work so hard at this, but somebody suggested a brilliant analogy that now I use all the time, which is seatbelts. Most people who die in car accidents are wearing seatbelts. It doesn't mean that seatbelts are useless. Or, you know, it, it's just that, and they do reduce the risk. It's just that they're not perfect. But nearly everybody is wearing a seatbelt. So that's, but it, it's a difficult argument. And I challenge people, explain that in 350 words. That, that's my um, challenge to everybody trying to do popular statistics. Okay, um, this was not appreciated by some. And it, I, I th I'm putting this up just to show the sort of stuff that, people who communicate have to deal with sometimes. So we got, you know, David Spiegel, Anthony Masters, you know, the entire lying genocidal editorial board of the Guardian should be hunted down and destroyed for crimes against humanity, period. So we got we get that sort of threatening abuse, not that often, but just sometimes. And um, how do you respond to that? We're quite lucky, we're white men. We haven't had that much, I don't get that much. Um, and we can respond to it quite lightly. Anthony was great, that seems harsh. I thought it was a good article. And I said, yeah, perhaps a bit harsh. I've had worse referees reports. So, you know, we made a joke out of it. The guy got banned from Twitter because that's considered a threat. Um, so it, it just points out that, you know, engaging, which I encourage people to do, you've got to be ready for what, what you might get back. Um, but look what happened to that data. Here is President Bolsonaro of Brazil using the data from the UK, there he is holding the sheets of paper to support his claims that COVID vaccines spread AIDS because more people who are getting, who are dying have been vaccinated than are not vaccinated. Look what's happened. And this happened again and again. Trump advisors um, Dem saying that, you know, telling a US Senate committee that the data from Scotland demonstrates conclusively that the vaccine is driving massive infections. So, Scotland stopped publishing that COVID case data, case rate data, because it was because it was being manipulated. Um, here it is, fully vaccinated now, up to three times more likely to die of COVID-19 than the unvaccinated. Just last week on GB News, this guy Mark Stain saying triple jabbed are four times more likely to die from COVID than, than people who haven't had the booster. Um, I, I complained to Ofcom, our regulator, about this stuff. So this is what can happen when data is released in a way that makes it easy for people to misinterpret it. I, I believe in the openness of information, but we've got to tell you, we've got to understand that there are players out there who really want to manipulate that information. I personally think this should not just be reported to the regulator. I think this is almost a criminal offence because if he encourages people not to have boosters, which we know save lives, that's a really dangerous thing to do. So I, it leads me naturally to the idea of trust and trust in numbers. And this is something that throughout the pandemic and well before, um, people involved with statistics, seeing the misuse, seeing the mistrust in science and, and authority that we you know, has just been demonstrating, um, it's become unbelievably important. I don't think we can separate our communication and public understanding from the ideas of trust. And in the UK, anybody, any discussion of trust, we go back to Honora O'Neill, who wrote, who did some wonderful lectures on trust years ago, the Wreath Lectures. And uh, I don't like TED Talks very much, but I do recommend this one. It's only nine minutes, TEDx Parliament. Um, she, she's a baroness. She, she's in the House of Lords. And she's a philosopher of Kant. And so she does this lovely TED Talk on trust, which is full up with Kant and jokes. And it's just brilliant. It's just brilliant. Okay, so... Her, what she thinks, and this is, I think, a really powerful, simple soundbite. She says that organizations, you know, status, you know, statistical bodies or whatever, authorities, we should not be trying to be trusted. You know, we all want to, you know, every, people come up to us and say, you know, how can we get ourselves trusted? How can we be trusted? No, she says, that's the wrong aim. You shouldn't be trying to increase trust. Now, remember, she's a philosopher of Kant. I've never read any Kant, but 
it's about duty ethics. You've got the people that act, you know, according to how you, um, according to the sense of duty. Um, she says there's a duty rather to demonstrate trustworthiness. It's a really powerful idea. Rather than expecting people to trust us, trying to persuade the audience to trust us, we have to demonstrate our own trustworthiness. We have to earn that trust. Wow, it, it just shifts the responsibility back to the authority. I think it's really powerful, very powerful indeed. And it's been enormously influential. Um, the Code of Practice for Statistics in the UK, and this is the body I'm on the board of, I mean, you know, it's not the most riveting reading, but it's very important. It's the one that's used when the Office for Statistics Regulation publicly criticizes the Prime Minister for the misuse of statistics, as they did last week. They, they, say they, they have to use this. And the first column of this is trustworthiness. The first pillar for the code of practices of statistics is trustworthiness. There's also quality and value, but trustworthiness is the number one criteria for statistics in the country. Okay, so I'm now going to just break something up. I hope this comes over. I've done a little video. Um, I, this is from two years ago on the main politics program in the UK, the Andrew Marr show, um, when um, I, we, I'd been watching the night before the, the briefings where ministers get up and tell about, tell, say about what's going on. And I got really angry. So rarely I did a sort of rant. Now I hope this comes over, please. Somebody tell me quickly if it doesn't, but. So now very familiar with these, these daily press briefings. How well are they working, do you think? Well, I, I watched yesterday's and frankly, I found it completely embarrassing. Um, we get told lots of big numbers in precise numbers of tests being done, 96,878. Well, that's not how many were done yesterday. They includes people that were posted out, test, tests that were posted out. We're told 31,587 people have died. No, they haven't. It's far more than that. So I think this is, you know, actually not a trustworthy communication of statistics. And it's such a missed opportunity. You know, there's a public out there who are broadly very supportive of the measures. They're hungry for details, for facts, for genuine information. And yet they get fed this, you know, what I call number theatre. Um, which seems to be coordinated really much more by, you know, a number 10 communications team rather than genuinely trying to inform people about what's going on. I just wish that the data was being brought together and presented by people who really knew uh, its strengths and limitations and could treat the audience with some um, respect. Yeah, OK, so that's, I mean, unusually, you know, to, for me, to do such a rant, it got a lot of coverage. As uh, there's 1.7 million views on on YouTube, and um, and, uh, and it got me on Gogglebox, if you know what that is. Um, but I, I uh, it so now, oh, yeah. So, I, and I feel that still very strongly indeed that we should be looking for trustworthy communication of evidence, and the statistics should be communicated not by the politicians but by people who understand the data, who treat the audience with respect. So I'd like to give now some positive, just to finish off, positive examples of when I think that can be, how that can be done. We, we wrote a paper, um, a nature paper, which I recommend, it's a very short read, little commentary, um, basically trying to put into some brief sound bites about what we felt were the important aspects of trustworthy communication of statistics and evidence. And the first thing is that one should not be trying to manipulate people's emotions to persuade them to think about, think in a certain way or do something, but to inform them, to raise the level of the debate. Then you've got to have balance, the positive, positives and negatives. Not a false balance, it's not all equal, you know, in climate change or anything, it's not all equal, but to have the balance. You've got to be upfront about uncertainties. You've got to be, you know, with the intervals and so on. You also got to be, I think, clear about how good the underlying evidence is about what you're, that you've got to base your conclusions on. And then you've also, I think, got to pre-bunk misinformation or preempt misunderstanding. So that's why I wanted to give that example of where the statistics were presented in a way that in, invited people to, um, that, that led to misinformation around the world. So, and that's so important to preempt that. Um, now, uh, just our example of working with that was when last year, if you remember, when the AstraZeneca vaccine was being linked to the blood, serious blood clots in the brain and elsewhere, and um, that was a deep concern around the world. And um, uh, our team, including Alex Freeman and John Aston, got sent the data on blood clots by age 
from the regulatory authorities and um, and were asked to help with the press briefing that was going to happen in two days time or well, actually the day after <laughs> we so we fitted some regression lines and we worked away through the night and, and um, in the morning uh, communicated with this I talked to this Jonathan Van Tam who is our deputy chief medical officer who was one of the most trusted figures throughout the pandemic sort of very good avuncular style um, and um, a, to explain you know our analysis of this and um, when it came to the briefing we were really surprised I was a bit shocked when he used our an, our analysis straight there he just presented it to the public and talked through it and you know that was our main slide and um, I thought oh he's not going to try to explain this is he in you know to a peak audience you know to, to everybody who's really peak news at this time um he's not going to try oh, and he did and he, he took his time he treated people with he understood it perfectly he took his time he treated the audience with respect brought them also you know into his confidence by saying that we're looking going to look here at the benefits and harms of the vaccine the vaccine has got harms and they go up as you get younger I mean, the harms in terms of the number of blood clots you'd expect per 100,000 people being vaccinated. If you look at the benefits and doing in terms of intensive care over 16 weeks, which is roughly equivalent to the, you know, the, the blood clot in terms of the harm, we can see the, the benefits go up hugely as you get older. You know, my age group here, well, you know, the harm, the benefits clearly outweigh the harms. Um, and this is a, at a point where there's fairly low exposure risk. But look what's happening to the under 30s. Well, this is really finely balanced. And he said, therefore, we're not recommending that AstraZeneca vaccine is, is to be given to the under 30s. And everyone nodded their heads and said, fine, no problem, no argument, no discussion, I mean, no, you know, no fuss, no panic, no nothing. It was, it was a really good piece of communication and this graphic then was picked up by all over the world and used by European medicines agency and things like that oh then we, we did it for high exposure risk of course and it's a very different a very different kettle of fish um and the next day in the sun the most popular tabloid newspaper you know I'm not sure that's how I would have reported it but um still um that that's you know it, it got very positive coverage and uh he you know so he just put into practice all the things we were saying and um, this is a more complex slide because it shows how communicating complex statistical um, information again is using these um uh I, they, they're not copying us they were doing this anyway uh, we, but it's an illustration of the sort of things we were talking about so this is quite complicated this is um looking at the effectiveness of the vaccine against the delta variant up here and the omicron variant um down here oh no omicron up here delta down here and um, this is against the effectiveness against infection, disease, hospitalization, and mortality for different amounts of vaccine. And uh, these are the estimates of the effectiveness. Now, notice a number of things here you know, about the communication. No central estimate, only a range. It's quite a neat trick. Don't, don't just have a single number. So nobody can quote a number. You've got to give a range. Then other times you can say there's insufficient data, just saying, I don't know, I'm not gonna say, I'm not gonna say. And even these ranges, some are based on better evidence than the others. They're using a rather odd grayscale here, but the, the white ones are the ones there's you know, limit, more limited evidence on. And these have got medium confidence. Of course, the older ones on Delta, there's very high confidence in these. So it's showing that they're doing the uncertainty, the quality of evidence, and so on. Really, really, I think, good communication of numbers there. Okay, so to conclude, um, I, I have felt, you know, I really believe that throughout uh, the pandemic that top quality statistical analysis is essential. It requires resources and careful coordination, but unbelievably important, I, I think, is trustworthy communication to all stakeholders and the public deserve it. They've sacrificed so much you know, during the pandemic, they really deserve to receive top quality information in a trustworthy way. Um, just to finish off about a small warning about speaking to the media, um, I, I've had all sorts of experiences. I've had every disaster, you know, everything's gone wrong. You know, I've, I've done everything wrong. Um, I th I'm not sure if this is a success or not. Um, to, uh, Christmas before last on the main radio program, I was talking about possible Christmas rules. I said raised voices could spread the virus. We know that maybe singing, maybe band. And it was, in fact, we, we could do our, our choir could sing carols outdoors with a mask two meters apart. 
And then I said, well, it might be a good idea to ban family arguments because, um, you know, over a Christmas table, all the windows closed, shouting at each other. Oh, terrible super spreader events. Um, this was a joke. Um, but just an hour later in the Daily Express, there was the headline, Christmas warning families could be banned from arguing to prevent COVID spread, according to a leading British statistician. Now, I'm not sure if that's a success or not, but I have had a lot of fun out of that. Okay, I'm going to stop now because I really look forward to hearing what the um, discussants have to say. Thanks very much, David. This is a terrific launch to our discussion. Let me um, highlight briefly five points you said. Very rightly, we need to care about the data that is going into the statistics, the definitions, the factors that shape collection, um, the limits of uh, standardization across countries and otherwise. We need comparisons, but comparisons are very complex, especially international comparisons, but also over time. There's a tension with the media's desire for blame and individual responsibility and for explanations of sudden short-term um, changes that could be statistic noise or something else. There are politicians' efforts to manipulate there's a tendency to miss out intervening variables and changes in underlying patterns like the proportion vaccinated, which affects any absolute number involving that baseline. And centrally, there is the importance of trustworthiness, which involves communication skills and choices, as well as reliable data and statistics. But if I heard you rightly, there's some reason to be optimistic that our capacities are growing faster than our failures in this area. Now, as I said at the beginning, we have three excellent discussants. The first of them is Carrie Mengerson, a distinguished professor in statistics at the Queensland University of Technology and director of the QUT Center for Data Science. She's an elected fellow of the Australian Academy of Science, the Academy of Social Sciences of Australia, She's also currently a vice president of the International Statistics Institute and leads its public voice portfolio. She is involved in national and international projects related to the COVID pandemic, particularly with respect to analysis of global patterns of infection, impacts of travel restrictions, and comparative benefits of vaccination. And a key component of her work, as of David's, is the translation of statistical insights for a larger public. Carrie. Uh, thank you very much, Craig, and thank you very much, David, for the thought-provoking presentation and the many excellent examples and anecdotes. It was excellent. I'd like to make three main comments. And the first one is about COVID-19 data. And on the one hand, we talk about having very little data as an epidemic or even as a pandemic emerges. So apart from having you know, every statistician in the country and in the world jumping up and down in their office desks with excitement, if not demonstrably so, then at least on the inside and scribbling like lots of journal articles and delighting in the misinterpretation of statistical graphics, this lack of data really motivates both action and inaction amongst our decision makers and the public. However, what I'd like to ask is, do we really have so little data at the beginning of a pandemic and even as it, as it goes through? I warrant that we actually have a lot of data, but the problem is that the relevant data are often siloed and they're difficult to access. And so health data remains in health departments, social services data remain in social service departments. And in fact, a sobering fact that was related to me is that in 80% of child deaths in Queensland, officials would have acted differently if they'd had access to the full information. And I'd argue that a similar sobering fact could be made about evidence-based decision-making for COVID-19. Importantly also, there's a wealth of other data. So countries can borrow from countries like them, and we can borrow from the experience of animal epidemics to inform human epidemics. And so my question is really, 
you know, have we really capitalised on the data that's available to us in this pandemic? And have we really learnt from it? The second comment is about the decisions that we make based on data. So as statisticians and for many decision makers, the concept of uncertainty, probability and risk are broadly accepted and to some functional extent understood. And there's a plus or minus around most numbers. And if an action involves a large cost for a very small increase in probability of benefit, then it's unlikely to be pursued. And you've talked a lot about the, um, the way that we understand you know, probability and risk in this talk and in, in many other presentations. But I'd argue also that the concept of probability and risk sort of changes when it becomes personal. So what's a small increase at a population level becomes much more meaningful and somehow different in its interpretation at an individual level. And so, for example, my perception of probability of the efficacy of chemotherapy as a cancer patient may be quite different from my perception as a professional statistician. And we've seen this in the pandemic, the perceived risk associated with a vaccine will depend on whether I've been personally associated with the disease. And indeed, we've also seen the reverse. So what's an obviously beneficial action at the population level, such as vaccination, may be seen very differently by an individual. So my question is, is there a way that we can more effectively harness this perception of personal probability in situations like a pandemic? Indeed, is there really a definition or an understanding of this personal probability? My third comment is about the role of professional societies in the pandemic. The International Science Council Action Plan for 2022 to 2024 has a dedicated COVID-19 section that includes actions such as the development of scenarios, the creation of a global science portal for sharing information and analysis, the consolidation of international collaborations around sustainability, recovery and education. And the International Statistical Institute has instigated a similar set of actions. At a national and at more local levels, professional groups in statistical science and data science have gathered to challenge, create and communicate. And my question is really, what more could we do as a profession at these various levels for COVID-19? And finally, yes, I can't count. Um, I want to comment briefly on what the pandemic has done for statistics. It was one of the questions. So there are many, many directions this has taken in new methods, new visualizations, new collaborations, new insights. Let me count badly the ways, but I want to touch on one, which is data sovereignty and data ethics. And the question is like, who owns our own health data? Who benefits from it? And how should we manage this? And how has this changed in the course of the pandemic? And, our, um, and in our ambition to help everyone, have we actually increased this data divide? And who is actually being helped? And who's being left behind? And finally, finally, in addition to using our visual senses to increase public understanding of statistics, as you so eloquently showed us, I'm wondering how can we use our other senses? For example, it's sometimes interesting for me to play the data. So can we hear signals that we may not necessarily see? Now I can't sing, but you can imagine if it goes like this, the, the sound of our epidemic goes donk, 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 as it goes up. And you can play the pattern of different countries in their response to the, to the pandemic. So can we hear signals that we may not necessarily see and can we use our other senses? And on that note, I'll stop. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Carrie. This uh, gives some great questions 
for David, but great questions for general discussion and for members of the audience and all of us about siloed data and limited attention to all the relevant dimensions, about perceived risk in population terms versus personal terms, the importance of the profession and professional associations, what statisticians do collectively uh, to inform the public. Uh, the issue of data sovereignty of uh, as one of I think you stress several in which the pandemic has brought attention to an issue but it may also have made some new inequalities um, even worse um, and the potential of moving um, not just from texts and numbers to visual representation, but possibly using other senses to improve understanding. So that's great. Our next discussant is Harpreet Singh, a computational biologist with experience in data management, machine learning, uh, data analysis, uh, research management. He did his PhD in bioinformatics. Um, from the Jawaharlal Nehru University and is a postdoc um, using NGS data analysis from Cornell University. He heads the Division of Biomedical Informatics at the Indian Council of Medical Research and the Computational Genomics Center of the ICMR. Currently, Dr. Singh is working on organizing data systems at ICMR and developing an integrated research platform. His team has developed data systems for 23 major programs um, in the ICMR, but also for the ministry, um, including the National COVID-19 Testing Database, which currently holds testing data for 800 million individuals. Um, let me say no more and turn this over to Harpreet Singh for questions. Thank you, David. And Craig, I hope I am uh, now audible clearly. Because the time when we started this call, I was, uh, you know, coming from office. So you have raised, you know, the previous speaker as both of you and both of you have raised very important and relevant questions and aspects of data science. One of which is, you know, some of which are very favorite to my else, mine also comparative and integrated data access and then manual interpretations rather than button statistics or button science. So as, I, as it is uh, mentioned in my introduction, I am not a statistician, but I'm a bioinformatician. And my team plays a, a background role, you can say, providing the relevant tables and numbers and figures to the statisticians so that they can play around with the data. So, with the COVID experience, uh, you know, I can tell you that data and statistics has played a major role. So my team and I am involved in COVID since the beginning in India. So we were called in January to develop a system for capturing the testing data across the country. So initially it was a very small endeavor. You know, we, we put up this federated architecture where data from all the laboratories at that time, there were very few limited laboratories in India who were doing RT-PCR test. And then the numbers increased. And then, you know, if you, if you think of India, we have 29 states, seven union territories, and a population of approximately 1.3 billion. So a lot of diversity. So this diversity is reflected in the system that we have developed. So this system is a federated system, but capturing data from multiple, multiple protocols. Like it is capturing data from the app, web apps, mobile apps, web applications. It is capturing from the APIs, from the state applications. So a lot of things are happening. So coming to the topic, I'm basically a data scientist at ICMR. Coming to the topic, statistics has really, really done a great job in managing pandemic in India. We have been providing trends of the positivity, weekly positivity rates, and related statistical uh, numbers to the national as well as to the state authorities, which are then using these numbers, identify hotspots, they are developing their policies, they are monitoring their policies, implementation programs. So another very important numbers that we are providing is the, is the TAT analysis turnaround time because initially, you know, testing time between testing and reporting was very high. 
So with this TAT analysis and then projecting the TAT analysis using uh, this uh, GIS mapping, we improved, identified the bottlenecks in the regions where you know this, this uh, testing time was more and then augmenting the lab capacities or putting up new labs. So this statistical analysis has really helped in improving the testing capacity in India. Further, we, we, we are, since I'm from the data science background, the integrated access of data, because we in India has three different major data sources. One is this uh, testing data that we are managing. Second is the national COVID-19 NHP data, which is managed by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. It captures information on the oxygen, oxygen beds, ICU beds, and the health, health infrastructure. So integrated access of both these data systems, the, the hospital infrastructure and the testing database has really helped in, in managing the pandemic waves. And then further, we have developed methodology for prioritizing vaccine delivery in different regions of the country based on the, based on the positivity rates. This paper is published in Vaccine Journal. And uh, you know, lastly, what I'm saying, what we are doing is we are doing this uh, integrated analysis of vaccination database, the third database, COVID, and the testing database to find out the breakthrough infections and to find out the repeat infections. So the questions that, you know, the challenges, I would say the challenges that we faced during this journey, and probably, you know, it is something that the entire world has faced is, you know, as my previous speaker has pointed out, existence of data sources in silos is one of the major challenge. This is what we have also faced. These three databases that I have mentioned, you know, it, is, it, it has been a very difficult task for us to integrate these three different data sources. So what I, I think it is required is we should work very carefully while developing these kind of data sources on the data planning, collection, storage, and responsible data dissemination. So this, these three things, four things, if we can capture, probably we can address 80, 90% of the challenge in developing integrated resources. Another challenge that I face is, is the quality of data. Quality in terms of data, data you know, the, the seven dimensions of quality is one aspect, but the quality also in terms of curation, quality in, also in terms of use of controlled vocabulary, standardized dictionaries. So all these areas needs to be developed. There are few standards available internationally, but these are not adopted by majority of the researchers. So we need to work on that and probably, you know, some agency has to come up with, with, with some implementation plan so that these different data sources can be integrated. At ICMR, I'm working on this plan. And another thing, very important thing aspect is, is the data communication, system to system communication. So my team is, is developing accessible data systems. We have done it for 23 programs of government of India accessible by accessibility. I mean that the system should be accessible to the individual as well as the system should also be accessible to other systems. So system to system communication should also be strengthened so that integrated analytics can be done, meaningful comparisons. Like you mentioned that comparative analysis has to be done very carefully. So those so, so meaningful comparisons can be done and meaningful statistical outputs insights can come out. So these are some of my experiences uh, with the COVID system. And, and just before I finish, you know, uh, a, a previous speaker has shown that there are more number of deaths in vaccinated individuals. So in fact, we did the same analysis and uh, we were also, you know, looking at this kind of picture, but then there is a statistical technique called person time analysis. I was not aware of that. Statistical uh, you know, experts told me that you have to do this way. And the results came out beautifully. You can check on our Ministry of Health and Family Welfare website. I can post the link. So the results clearly indicates that during the second wave and the third wave, majority of the deaths, I would say large number of deaths were in the unvaccinated individuals. Vaccinated individuals were clearly protected. So if, if, you, if you allow, I can share that slide screenshot. Shall I? Please. 
so there is there is some challenge but you can check on the ministry of health and family welfare website so this shows there are three lines one is one dose vaccination two dose vaccinated and unvaccinated two dose and one do and, and even in the percent time analysis if we calculate the efficacy of vaccines it is coming something like 99.0 with two doses during the so what i mean to say is that it is the it is a type of statistical it is a way that you look at the data things drastically change so this data has been presented to the public to the various authorities saying that vaccines are really effective please go ahead and probably this is one of the reason that we have such a huge success in the vaccination campaign in spite of all this resistance and hesitance yeah i think i should close here and thank you okay thanks very much Harpreet, for um, these comments. Let me just note for our future discussion, um, Harpreet, Harpreet mentions he comes from data science and the existence of this field that overlaps statistics, um, but isn't the same as statistics is important. It has to do with data, but one of the things that changes, and I think his remarks bring this out, is the um, extent to which statistics and the provision of data for statisticians are discrete and neatly separate. So we have the issue that brilliant statistics cannot make up for bad data um, and the importance of improving our data sources, integrating them all, but also the potential for statistical analysis to help clarify where there are problems with data um, and actually uh, bring more relevant data to the fore. For example, the turnaround time analysis that Harpreet referred to. Um, he stressed the value in the pandemic of having data not just on the disease, but on hospital infrastructure and integrating this kind of um, infrastructural information with um, others. Um, he stressed in agreement with previous speakers that data sources come pre-organized according to some logic or another. They're often siloed and we can work to improve this. Um, and the pre-organization um, may be a matter of problematic definitions that can be improved by standardization and Harpreet calls for more standardization. Of course, it may be a matter of bureaucracies, as Carrie stressed, who's doing the data collection? Is, how is this organized in different units? Um, and Harpreet called for uh, the, us to attend to the issue of access. And it seemed to me in two ways both as a technical problem in communication among systems and the extent to which our different data systems are able to intercommunicate well, um, and as an issue for individuals' control of their own information, which has been a very important concern um, in the public. Uh, let me remind everyone that they can post their questions to the Q&A function, and after our third discussant, we'll give David a chance to respond and then open up to a broader discussion. Our third discussant is Ellen Peters, the Philip H. Knight Chair and Director of the Center for Science Communication Research at the University of Oregon. Ellen studies the basic building blocks of human judgment and decision-making and their links with effective communication techniques. She is particularly interested in how affective, intuitive, and deliberative processes help people perceive risks and make decisions. In addition to many journal articles, she's the author of Innumeracy in the Wild, Misunderstanding and Misusing Numbers, published by Oxford University Press, she has worked extensively with US federal agencies to advance decision and communication sciences, health and health policy, including serving as chair of the Food and Drug Administration's Risk Communication Advisory Committee and member of um, the National Academy of Sciences, Science of Science Communication Committee. Ellen? Craig, thank you. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. And David, that was a great talk. I love your work and I enjoyed the talk immensely. Uh, I, I particularly appreciated your focus on the meaning of statistics, including your AstraZeneca example. I, I thought that was brilliant, actually, that one little visualization. Um, I'm going to follow your lead in, in, my, in my discussion, and I'm going to talk about what I know about. I am not a statistician. I'm, a I, I'm what's called a decision psychologist. 
And I, I often study issues about the impact of statistics along with people's math ability or, or what we call numeracy. Um, and we look at that in risk perception, in comprehension and risk perceptions and decisions. And I, I'd like to touch briefly um, on probably three points today. Um, and, and the first is just emphasizing again, and I thought you did a great job of this, David, but the, the importance of statistics during COVID, but also to good decision-making in general. Um, because having access to, to statistics can, can be viewed as a matter of survival during the pandemic, but it also can help quality of life in any of a variety of other kinds of health situations and financial kinds of situations. Um, and, and having that access is important because the first thing that we need to make good decisions is that information. It has to be available. It has to be accurate. Um, we have to get it in, in a timely fashion. So, so information, statistics is important. But it, it, you know, it's not just about getting the statistics out and having people receive them. Um, uh, it, to, to make good decisions, people have to be able to understand that. And you've done a lot of, and you've had a lot of focus on that in your research. Um, but not only understand it, like being able to repeat back a number, but um, to understand its meaning, as, as you brought up. That's very, very important. And then determine meaningful differences between options. Then um, decision makers have to weight the factors um, in order to match their needs and values. And that assumes they can identify their needs and values, which itself is a whole nother can of worms. Um, then they, they need to make trade-offs and ultimately they have to choose. They have to make some choice. They have to take some behavior. And a, as a result, what looks at, at, you know, in a superficial way, what looks at, as looks like a simple process, just pick one, ends up actually being cognitively complex and psychologically rich. Um, and, and, you know, we, we can take um, uh, simple comprehension of numbers. That, that, that's especially difficult, perhaps, with statistics, um, as many people are enumerate. So just to give the audience a little bit of a flavor, um, almost a third of U.S. adults and almost a quarter of U.K. adults can do only very simple processes with numbers. They can count. They can sort. They can use very simple probabilities like 50 percent, and they can, they can, but they can only understand those numbers if there aren't many distractors around them. And so we have fairly large proportions of our population that are really quite poor with numbers, including, including with statistics. Um, and it's not, it, it's, it's not just even about the public. Um, numeracy can even be compromised among experts. There's a particularly egregious e example that I ran across. Um, a doctor had told a, an elderly woman, a woman um, towards the beginning of the vaccine rollout that she shouldn't get the vaccine because 99% of people fight off COVID, but the vaccine is only 93% effective. Now we can argue whether he had the statistics correct, but apparently um, he thought that because 99 was greater than 93, that the vaccine was not worthwhile. The doctor had the statistics, he could repeat them back verbatim, but he was horribly incorrect. And his, his, advice, was, his advice was life threatening. Um, what we've been doing in my lab in a series of studies, it, well, not just in my lab, in other people's labs around the world, there, there have been many people adding, contributing to the science. Um, we, we've discovered that, that numeric ability, that math ability, that ability to understand and use statistics ends up mattering in ways that also go way beyond the simple comprehension of numbers. And it highlights the, the real importance of statistics because overall, the people who are less numerate, those people who are less mathematically proficient, they do understand less, but they also make worse decisions and they experience worse outcomes in health and in finances, um, where the more numerate people will seek out numbers, think hard about them, transform them in useful ways, look at your graphs and try to make their way through the, um, the, the, the kind of swamp of numbers in some ways that we've seen in the pandemic. People who are less numerate um, seem to neglect the numbers. They don't necessarily understand them. They don't necessarily look at them. Um, and they're more susceptible, their decisions are more susceptible to stories that they hear from family and friends in the media. They're more influenced by their own emotional reactions from, what, whatever, from whatever source. Um, and they're more likely to take mental shortcuts in decisions that bypass the numbers, that bypass the statistics um, compared to people who are better with numbers. But, as you know, when statistics are, pre are presented better, people are able to understand them better. And the less numerate, that's particularly true because they already don't understand much. But it's not just that they understand them better, they can actually make better choices. 
And what all of this to me, what this means to me is that there's a really vital role for psychologists and communication experts in interdisciplinary collaborations with statisticians to understand what the, not only what the public understands about the statistics, but what do they do with them when they're provided? So that was one point. Um, second point is um, how understanding the psychology of decision-making um, and decision-making with numbers can help us to understand um, what in statistics communication works and doesn't work and did and didn't work during the, during the pandemic. Um, communicating just the facts, including statistics, just giving them out, making them accessible, it's often not enough. Um, in fact, presenting statistics to people without considering whether they're understandable, whether they're usable, it's like throwing good money after bad. You, you, you've kind of tossed it out into a world that can't see them. At the same time, presenting numeric facts is super important. People prefer getting statistics. They find them useful. Um, providing them, and this goes back to your, your discussion about, about trust and trustworthiness, David, providing them can also um, help to earn people's trust if you do it in, in, in the right way, and it can motivate um, healthier behaviors in the pandemic and in other situations. But studies show us that how statistics are presented can be as important as what statistics are presented. It's not just about the statistics, it's about how they're presented. And it's especially true, again, for people who are less good with math. When information is presented well, people, and especially the less numerate, will rely less on emotions and stories and more on those statistics. Um, and there are, there are some well-established principles that can, be, that can be used to guide how we communicate, whether you're speaking to an individual or, and, and more, David, you've been addressing the public in a variety of ways. Um, and the strategic process starts with pick a communication goal. The communication goal is what the audience needs to understand based on sometimes what experts think the public should know. And, and, but in addition to that, what the public already knows and doesn't know and what they want to know what's important to them. And then this goal can be used to drive what information you present and how it's presented. It drives sort of that whole subsequent strategic communication process. And, you know, we can talk about some COVID examples here. Um, you know, COVID statistics um, have often been presented without context. And of course, people didn't have prior experience with them. So like the number of case counts, for example. I, I'm not sure, even knowing a lot about numbers, I'm not sure that I care that there were 5,723 new infections today. I, it, it, it's an absolute number of cases, we often see it. But these numbers are difficult, not just from the perspective of the quality of the data, as you were pointing out, David, um, but also on the whole, they're abstract and probably meaningless to people. On top of that, we're comparative creatures by nature. Um, and so we, we um, so, so, so once we choose, once a communicator chooses a communication goal, one way of making that data meaningful is to provide a relevant comparison. Instead of say, talking about, and, and you mentioned this in your talk, David, instead of talking about uh, the, the number of people who, the number of, of vaccinated people who have been, who have been, um, uh, who have been hospitalized, I think you said a communication goal could be chosen, and that might be educating the public on how protective the vaccine is, and especially against hospitalization and death if infected. But then what you need to do is you need to provide a, a, a normed comparison. The data for the breakthrough infections could be transformed to hospitalizations per 100,000. And then you could look at that separately for vaccinated people, but also unvaccinated people, because they need to see that comparison um, in order to draw meaning from the data and have that data come alive for people. Um, so providing those relevant comparisons really can make statistics come alive. But people are also tripped up, um, and, and uh, I'm not meaning to criticize you, David, but people are also tripped up by the overly complex. And some of the, some of the slides that you should, there's a lot of numbers there. Um, and people who are less numerate probably are not gonna be, almost certainly are not gonna be able to make their way through that data. Maybe they're not the intended audience of the particular slides you happen to, sh to show. But the overly complex when it comes to, 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 when it comes to statistics just loses a lot of people. Um, and what that means is that policymakers and others need to reduce the cognitive burden of communications, doing the math for people, making sure that, um, that denominators are the same across comparisons. There was uh, one example of a COVID communication where they were comparing death rates among different groups in, in the United States in this case. And they said um, that uh, one in 1,020 people had died in one group and one in 2,150 had died in another group. 
well, you know which you know, David, which of those two groups had more had a larger death rate, but a lot of people don't. They see the larger number and they think immediately, oh, okay, that, that group is more at risk. But instead, you can transform it to the same denominator, like 10,000, and suddenly it, it's it's a risk of 10 in 10,000 compared to 5 in 10,000. And again, it pops alive with meaning. Um, it's often it's it's often better to do the math for people to provide less information to provide fewer options if it's a decision situation, but mostly to focus on the communication goal and the specific st statistics that are necessary to attain it and in a form that's that's going to be helpful to meet that communication goal. Um, solving communication problems, of course, won't solve everything. Other challenges exist, um, but not everyone understands or is motivated by the facts. And so by communicating pandemic statistics that can, that can embrace um, foundations, foundational psychological and behavioral science principles will lead to statistics that can inform and promote action rather than confuse. And then the third thing I wanted to mention, and this goes um, a bit beyond what, what we're talking about here, but I think it's super important. Um, it's the need for funding. It's the need to elevate funding for large scale studies at the intersection of statistics and behavioral science as a priority and before the next pandemic and not to treat um, the, the communication of statistics as an afterthought. It is important and it's, and it's key and it needs to be funded. Modern science is amazing, but in the end, we know during this pandemic, people are the ultimate active actors and their behaviors are simply not on point when it comes to individual and societal well-being. Um, so we know a lot from our current body of evidence about how to present statistics better, and we can use that now, as you pointed out in any of a variety of ways in your talk, David, um, but we don't know everything, and especially in some of the wicked environments we find ourselves in, whether it's COVID-19 or it's climate change, which is going to be faced with similar issues and is already faced with similar issues. Pandemic statistics, climate change statistics are novel and they're difficult for people. Um, and you know what I always talk about with people is when else have you found yourself living in the midst of science being developed on the fly and all of those statistics being developed on the fly? So what it means is we need to support, somebody needs to support large clinical trials, scalable interventions, pe um, people who are statisticians working with behavioral scientists um, who understand human behavior in order to figure out how to do this better. Um, uh, Francis Collins was um, our retiring uh, director of our National Institute of, Institutes of Health just recently. Um, and back in December of 2021, he said, in, as he said in an interview, maybe we underinvested, underinvested, bleh, if I could say the word, maybe we underinvested in research on human behavior. I never imagined a year ago that we would still have 60 million people not get vaccinated. We need to elevate funding on human behavior and statistics as a priority to communicate well in the next pandemic and the next crisis so that people can make better decisions for themselves and society. And thank you again for your talk, David. It was, it was just wonderful. I really appreciated getting, um, getting to hear it, but also have getting the opportunity to chat with you a little bit about it. Thanks very much, Ellen. Um, all of the discussants have given you some um, important questions to think about. While I summarize some from Ellen, start thinking, please, David, because I'll call on you next. But Ellen has, has called our attention to um, some things I think are very crucial here. One is not just trying to be a good communicator, but thinking about um, the audience to whom you're communicating. Uh, so first instance, making data and statistics meaningful in terms of the decisions that policymakers are actually confronting so that they're not just good in the abstract, but um, well-designed to speak to the immediate decisions. And you or any of the other panelists may have examples of efforts to do that. The second is the issue of the psychology of how people respond to and grasp statistics. Uh, the, the simple, sad example is all the people who don't because they simply turn the page when they confront the formulae or the graphics or the other statistics and go on, but also um, a variety of more specific issues. And um, I urge attention to her question, which I would phrase as excess complexity. Um, that is how to judge when there's too much complexity. What um, is the 
way in which we come to distract people from um, the understanding of a main relationship by presenting too much information about other things that are going on. Uh, for example, I think statisticians are not the only academics and highly trained professionals who try to be more precise than helps with communication in many settings. Um, finally, Ellen also stressed the role, well not finally, two things, the role for interdisciplinary collaboration, um, importance of psychology and communications. And actually I think running through um, many comments here, yours, David, Carrie's, is a recognition of the extent to which public understanding of communications depend of statistics depends on the statistics and depends on uh, skills in communication and capacities in communication. Um, but do we have um, uh, good ways of improving in this? Um, and I think a key point is that if the clarity is not achieved by the experts in their communications. This leaves room for and gives rise to somebody else doing the work of clarification and maybe doing it with biases and intent to manipulate. That is, um, if the statisticians are not clear, then there will be people um, in the world of Twitter or there will be politicians who present an ostensibly clearer but possibly inaccurate picture. Um, so there's an urging. And of course, I won't take it as a question. I'm going to take it as probably agreed that funding is important, both funding for improving data and funding for advancing science here. Um, so um, back to you, if you would like to comment briefly on questions from the panelists, and then I'm going to open this up to questions from the Q&A. Yeah, I'd just like to comment quickly, but really good, really good, um, um ideas from everyone I, I start with if we start from the sort of beginning of this data cycle i start with it with harper I, I i i'm so hugely in admiration of that what can be th rather thankless work of trying to bring everything together in every format every laboratory doing something different every state with its different information system and i i you i feel your pain you know the, and it, I mean, it's bad enough in the in the UK because they you know they're trying to bring together countries from you know stuff from England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, all of whom would do different things. But every Indian state, I mean, this is like having you know different countries doing it. so. It, it's unbelievably difficult, incredibly valuable, and as you say, this is the big lesson that we got to learn that we shouldn't have to do this every time. We need these ideas of the communication of the data, as 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 Kerry said, the data the ability to share the investment in that. And I don't see a now, I, I love the growth of data science as an idea. I think it's so powerful because it, it, it emphasizes this idea, which is, you know, I push in my book, but only because I've really stolen it from other good teachers of statistics of the whole data cycle. The thing usually statisticians like me have been obsessed with is this tiny little bit where you do p-values and all this stuff and Bayesian analysis. But actually, that's only one tiny segment of this whole business of setting a problem and trying to establish the data sources and bringing it all together and then doing some analysis and then communicating it all. And during COVID, that little bit in the middle, the clever stuff, has actually been utterly minimal compared with the importance of all the rest of the cycle, the, the bringing it together and then the communication. When we come to the communication, and uh, you know, I, I totally agree with Ellen about, you know, I've, I've learned so much from you and Barrett Fishoff and others that, you know, what's good communication? Well, tell me what, what you're trying to do, who the audience is and what the aims are, and then I might tell you what, be able to evaluate your communication. And it depends absolutely crucially to work out what you're trying to do. And, you know, what you say about putting things in context, numbers don't exist on their own. I, but I, so I just, and oh, and the funding, well, we have been doing experiments for different formats, but we've been lucky, we've had philanthropic funding to run those randomized online trials for different formats for presentations. Not easy to get that funding normally from normal bodies because people don't think it's important. But you'd hope that now they might think that's important. So something that brings together though what Kerry and, and um, and Ellen has said is do with this idea of personal risk and I'd like to just set this as a challenge 
I spent two years essentially trying to explain, you know, COVID risks at an individual level um, and failed dismally. And um, I mean, right from two years ago, we knew that the risk if you got COVID was roughly the same as it was so age dependent in a very similar way to normal background risk. But it's roughly equivalent to your annual risk of dying, you know, in the previous year, you know, of other things, you know, that if you're vulnerable or, or old, your risk goes up normally and it goes up with COVID. All COVID does is, is you know, increase your background risk. That's why the average age of people who die from COVID is the same as the average age of people die normally. So, and, it, and I thought, well, that'll explain it because we know about the background risk, actuarial risk is exponential. And oh, surely that will explain it. No, it's absolutely hopeless because people don't grasp just how much the enormous age gradient and risk there is. So you can tell somebody that an 80 year old has got 10,000 times the risk of dying of a 10 year old or something like that normally and with COVID and it means absolutely nothing. So we found when using absolute risks is hopeless because it's tiny numbers, using relative risks are hopeless because they're so big and they vary so much and people don't grasp that. So again, we sp spent a lot of time trying to work on context, as Alan said, do we compare with somebody of the same age, but without any health problems? Do you say, I, the one I like is, is the you've got the same risk as a health, you, you're 40, but you got, because of your health problems, you've got the same risk as a healthy 70 year old or something like that. So it's all to do with trying to give some perspective against a metric that people can actually grasp because they cannot find it really difficult to grasp the idea of exponentially increasing the risk. Um, and, and I tried everything. I failed dismally. And so actually the, the, throughout this whole pandemic, there's been an utter failure by everybody all bodies to communicate the variation in risk across the population, the minimal risk to children, enormously high risk to old people, and, and, and that age dominates every other factor. So with the result that we still got people saying, we've got to protect our children in schools, which is ridiculous. And we've got to, um, and, and lots of people with very minor health problems, young, still terrified of this virus, which is, you know, in the UK at the moment, you can't walk out the door without catching, you know, so there you go. And so there's people who won't walk out the door. So I, I think this is an utter failure. I mean, I mean, I know it's not just a matter of telling people, of course, but as Alan said, it's the, the trying to find a narrative, a comparator, um, a structure, a story in that actually gives people this, uh, an idea of the magnitude. I, I failed completely and I would love to know if People have got ideas on how they might go about it now or in the future, because I think that has been a, a big failure. Right. Thanks, David. So what I'm going to do is to uh, digest and re repeat uh, questions from the Q&A um, and then give the panelists a chance serially to respond to them and then give David a chance for the last word, if that's okay, um, and not try to go one by one because we don't have that much time left. Um, but a, a beginning to this is that runs through many is how do we make um, our uh, statistical information more meaningful? And you were just speaking to that, David. Um, with the widespread difficulty people have, are many difficulties, including thinking about more than two variables at a time, and thus being able to look at the various kinds of population-specific adjustments of risk that quickly become too complicated. So, a um, and this bears especially on this issue of estimating individual effects that Carrie raised, and there's a question from Craig Pickett about that, and David, in a way, asked that, which is, I will boil it down to, Carrie, can you solve this problem for us? Um, but if you can't, can you clarify um, and um, um, point us in good directions for making discussions of risk meaningful at personal rather than only at population levels? Um, other questions. Kara Morgan asks um, about the, the rapid increase in the number of dashboards during the pandemic. Now, not just about the pandemic, I think we see this increase in every place. Um, every university now has all kinds of dashboards presenting various sorts of data. Who decides what shows in the case um, of statistics about public health and the pandemic? Um, and what are the risks that these dashboards um, 
uh, instead of clarifying and simplifying, will give a false impression. Uh, Tim King asks a question, uh, maybe particularly appropriate for Harpreet, but for everyone. Have computers changed data for better or worse? Or rather than just a summary judgment, can you give examples of each ways in which um, the machine learning and computer collection and widely ubiquitous so-called big data um, uh, has uh, brought improvements in cases where there have been problems. Um, and uh, a concluding question from me, um, which is, what is the impact of variables, the exclusion of variables on which we don't have quantitative data? Um, do we um, potentially misrepresent by focusing on the factors for which we have good quantitative data, producing analyses that overrepresent these factors at the expense of possibly very important other factors, which could be woven into a narrative account, but aren't easily rendered um, in statistical terms. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm going to go in the same order we went before and invite Carrie first. My goodness, it's like, um, they're, they're great questions. Uh, so the question to me, I think, was around individual uh, risk. And uh, and if David can't solve that, and then you know we, we all have a, a great difficulty in doing it. I, I wish I had the answer as well. Um, I was interested in the comment in the in the chat actually about the uh, the sports medicine example and um, the magnitude based inference um, reference there. So I'm very happy to talk about that at some point and um, and that's a modeling question and and how we might be able to think about that uh, from a sort of a, a statistical modeling perspective. But in general, then what we're trying to understand is how we can actually incorporate this individual risk inside the as, as part of the population risk and again like what is that actually representing in terms of um, you know what we're trying to characterize like current risk or characterize some predictions um, of risk so all of that means you know this is a wide open area I, I think my my reference in in my discussion was really about the way that we interpret these kinds of numbers and um, and the way that we make decisions on the basis of probability and uh, if we know that there's some uncertainty or we know there's some risk or some probability, then how we actually uh, make or take an action and make a decision on the basis of that really is in the context of, of where we are in, in our own um, perception of that, um, that number. And, uh, and I think that that's really important for us to remember that uh, you know, when, we, uh, when we have this information, then um, or we're propagating this information, then the way that it's going to be consumed will be in the context of whatever else is in our lived experience at the time. Okay, great. Um, Harpreet, do you want to come in? Yes, I think I'll address that question that uh, whether computers have played a good role or a bad role. <clears throat> it is a very, very you know interesting question, I would say. The answer, straightforward answer is, it's is the way we use the computers. One way is as I label, you know, I have mentioned in my presentation also button bioinformatics or button statistics. So which, which follows very strongly the GIGO principle garbage in garbage out. So other that I'm again quoting uh, what David has said is understanding the concept and then interpreting. So computers are both good and bad. It depends on how we use it. If I give you an example, good example, because I have you know, very closely associated with data and data scientists and statisticians. Good example is we have used this data very, very you know, importantly in identifying hotspots and then putting conditional lockdowns. So this has really proved effective and one paper is coming out very soon. And the bad is the number of models, predictive models that uh, people have developed predicted that wave is coming in another month, one month, 15 days, creating a havoc and panic in the population. <laughs> so I hope I have answered the question in a very diplomatic manner. So <laughs> it depends Extremely on... diplomatic. We hadn't yeah. 
stress the importance of statisticians, especially those who work with the government, <laughs> um, being diplomatic. <laughs> but it's real. David, you wanted to get in a quick well, comment? I, 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 sorry, I just, uh, that is so brilliant. And I, I love that, love that. Example. I love the way you did it. But you're, what you're identifying is the difference between statistics, understanding what is going on at the moment, identifying the hotspots and things like that, and speculating as to what might happen in the future. And the problem is that we know the difference between those, but many people don't. Well, the problem is also, David, that many people use what appear to be statistics um, to offer their speculations. Uh, right? let, let, me, let me add a small thing here. You know, David rightly mentioned predictive models are really very important. But the thing is, there are a lot of people who don't understand what a predictive model, you know, develop a model. They have some psychic libraries in the Python and then they develop models and then predict that, you know, in another two months, there is a wave and then publish in the newspaper. So a lot of questions come to agencies like us that you, do you think there is a wave in two months? Do you think there is this? So this is a bad statistics. Unless you have understood how a wave happens, what are the factors, you know, in a, in a given environment, wave can only happen if you have a low vaccine, if you have vulnerable population, if you have, you know, crowded places, if you have some, you know, this, this uh, festival season going on, because in India, there is a lot of festival seasons went away. So then, you know, considering all these factors, if you predict wonderful, but if you predict just by the numbers that today, the numbers are 10 tomorrow, 20, and then there will be another number 30. This is a bad statistics, bad, you know, way of using computers. Okay, we turn now um, for comments um, from uh, Ellen uh, to any of the questions, uh, but including, I think, one thing running through this, which is, in effect, there will be a narrative. The question is, who will produce it and how well will it incorporate available statistical knowledge? Is that fair? I guess I'm not sure what that question is. Y yes, there will be. A, yes, there will be a narrative. Well, is it fair to say that no matter how precise the statistics that are developed, they will be incorporated into narratives? Um, they will not simply stand on their own as statistics. And so, much of the question before us, and a question for psychologists, communications experts, and others is um, to um, evaluate and to try to improve the processes of, of incorporation into narratives. Yeah, so I, I guess the way I would answer that is a number is just a number. It's an abstract thing that sits there on a piece of paper or on a, on a, on a website um, when, when it comes to communication with people. But it does, uh, until it has meaning, it's not going to have it. It, it actually probably can't be incorporated in, into a story unless someone decides to, uh, until someone decides to bring in some kind of a context for it, some kind of an interpretation of the number, some kind of a comparison, some way of conveying the number in a way that can, um, that can touch some, that can touch somebody in their decision-making. And, you know, that can be done um, with goodwill and not with goodwill, um, for, for lack of a better way of saying that. Um, it can be used to drive someone's agenda. It can be used to try to simply promote comprehension and, and understanding. Um, so I'm not sure if it quite answers your question, but I think it gets to um, the importance when you're presenting statistics, um, understanding that idea that they're kind of abstract and meaningless for people until you help them more. Um, but to help them more, you have to have a communication goal. Um, and that actually goes to Kara Morgan's question about, um, uh, she was talking about the dashboards and who decides what, um, uh, and who decides what information is going to be shown. That, that all comes back to um, the importance and the need for a communication goal that is focused on something that people need to make a decision about. Because otherwise, why are you just providing information? It's just information. Um, information is there in order to help people do something better. Um, unless you happen to be someone who likes to collect facts, that uh, some people like to collect facts. But in general, in general, that's not why policymakers are providing information. Um, I thought I'd hit just um, on two other questions quickly, if I could, um, on David's question about um, personal risk and success versus failure. I would actually um, turn that back on you, David, because I don't know what you mean by your operationalization of what is success and what is, how are you measuring that? 
because you can measure that by in, in a verbatim kind of way. Can someone repeat back a fact? You can measure it in terms of um, are people sensitive to different levels of risk? That's another um, oper operationalization. You can measure it with congruence with values, but then some of your examples might have been congruence with that person's values. They might, someone who's very afraid of COVID still, might um, themselves fear the catastrophic outcome so much that, that that's a very reasonable response. Or they might, um, and I have many friends like this, they fear spreading the disease to other people that they know. And that that's an so, so I so I don't know what I don't know what your definition is, but I would love to chat if you ever feel like it. Um, and then just very quickly on one other question: What's the impact of excluding variables on which we don't have data? Um, there's some absolutely beautiful work by Christopher Shee on a concept called evaluability. And essentially, what happens if you're in separate evaluation looking to just judge a single thing, and you've got numeric information and you have non-numeric information that people are able to evaluate? Um, uh, on its own. So like if you're choosing a book and it has 10,000 entries, but it has a torn cover, that torn cover matters a lot. The number of entries doesn't matter at all. It makes no difference to people. But if you have, if you're in a joint evaluation position, you have two different dictionaries, two different books side by, two different dictionaries side by side. One is 10,000 entries with a torn cover. Uh, I'm sorry. One has 10,000 entries with a torn cover. The other has 5,000 entries and it looks like new. Suddenly the torn cover doesn't matter. You want the book with the greater number of quantitative entries. Um, and so that, that concept of evaluability is actually quite powerful and it, just a beautiful concept from Chris Shee. Great, thanks. Well, um, back to you at the end of this um, and uh, with knowledge that it's an ongoing conversation that all statisticians and indeed everybody who cares about the public understanding is gonna have to keep working on, David? Yeah, just to finish off brief, briefly. Yeah, these are so, there's so many threads here that you know I could just carry on gossiping around, you know, talking about for for ages and and ages. Um, but you know, and, and uh, you know, we all thinking I think in very similar ways about the enormous value of this work. But the 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 crucial issue of essentially bringing the, the you know other other stakeholders with us in terms of the policymakers pub media and public, how absolutely vital that is. Um, I, I, um, I haven't got any answer on the, yeah, the success and failure, this is more just a, a general feeling that there's no discourse, accepted discourse for individual risk around COVID particularly. There's no metric that's commonly used, whatever. It's all up to people's gut feelings about their anxieties and their fears. So I, I think, and that's, a, I think is a real, a real lack um yeah um so just i'd just like to fi finish off one thing the um this idea of you know the missing information i think it's really important particularly if you don't know what you're missing and um it, it it's this other type of uncertainty we're used to you know the uncertainty of chance and you know what might happen in the future we're used to the uncertainty about not knowing what's going on at the moment but the other side kind of uncertainty which is you know to do with maybe we our, our whole conceptualization is is inadequate is is maybe we're just not getting at what we really think we're getting at um i as a statistician I, i've always been obsessed with what we can measure but i'm now increasingly feeling what we can't measure if we think of the impact of the non-health impact of covid they're enormous and yet our measures of well-being in the population are deeply limited really inadequate we can ask people how happy they are and we've got some metrics, but it's, you know, we know it's not measuring well-being in the population. And so I, I suppose, I'm, you know, feeling this humility of realising how inadequate our, our, our metrics are. And what this makes me and what we've been trying to do, say, with the vaccine thing, we had benefits and harms. And it, it, was, it was good. It was good. I thought it was a good bit of work. But actually, those aren't the, just the only benefits and harms. In fact, there's benefits and harms we don't even know. So that itself was a, a huge simplification. It was good. I, I, I'm proud of it. But actually, it was inadequate. And so, and you can express almost, you know, in a Rumsfeldian sense, the unknown unknowns. We're, we're, on our later versions of that graph, we put at the bottom in print, these are not the only benefits and harms. Others might include... The benefits to other people of being vaccinated etc etc but even that doesn't exhaust the list of there may be harms we don't know there may be benefits we don't know so 
trying to put communicate as part of your communication the limitations of your whole conceptualization i think is a is a is a challenge but i think it's important because otherwise it just looks as if these numbers are the whole thing and that we know that's not what's going on but this is that's a really big issue and i suppose i'm just um extra i managed to get to my senior age um and only just realized that everything i've been doing has been so inadequate for my entire life so i, I think it's just been a bit of a shock to me to, to um to uh to be accosted by this something that other people have known for so long <laughs> yeah well i just want to speak for all the others who think what you've been doing is pretty wonderful david so <laughs> don't be too hard on yourself um it's true that there are improvements let me um i can't resist pointing out one um factor in all of this that we have barely attended to, which is almost all of our analyses and our examples today have been essentially national. Um, looking um, at data collected in countries about what's going on in the countries. And there are a variety of other things that come up. So in this issue of the known unknowns or whatever, we have um, the issue of vaccine um, availability in other parts of the world, say in Africa. Um, where we can, uh, we have a clear metric for tracking the delivery of vaccines and no clear metric for tracking the capacity um, to in fact get the vaccines um, in distributed and into arms um, around the country. We work harder on that. Um, we have a variety of issues with what is in fact a very international, transnational pandemic um, that challenge us to think um, beyond the implicit um, uh, nationalism of the way our data come pre-structured as national data. Um, that's just one of a number of issues that remain. The field of statistics will continue to evolve and improve. Our ability to communicate statistics effectively will, I hope, continue to evolve and improve. Um, we will continue to be led uh, by David Spiegelhalter, by Carrie Menderson, by Helen Peters, by Harpreet Singh, um, as we work on these issues um, on behalf of the International Science Council and the uh, International Statistics Institute. Let me thank everyone who's been in the audience and above all, thank our terrific presenters for a really good and informative webinar. Thank you.